At one point, you wrote or, and or spoke about what you called the backwards evolution in Russia within days, I think you said, of Vladimir Putin taking power in 2000. Do you draw any parallels between that and what you see in the U.S. now? Um, yes. I mean, I think we have to be careful with, with parallels, yeah. right? Because these are very different men. They mm -hmm. came to power in very different ways. They inherited very different systems and very different political yeah. cultures, right? So, uh, that, you know, I just want to acknowledge that yeah. because I also think there is very instructive similarities and there are also themes that run through all sorts of populist uh, leadership uh, ways that um, uh, that are important to, to note, you know, and it's not just Putin and Trump, it's also, you know, Kaczynski in Poland and Orban in, in Hungary. Um, so that said, I mean, I think there's, uh, there's something inherent in that kind of populism that it appeals to an imaginary past. And so the sort of reversal of, of the cultural vector uh, is something that happens immediately. Um, and I think, you know, here we hear uh, a lot about sort of the straw man of, of political correctness. Mm -hmm. We want to reverse that, right? Um, and, um, and just one of the many uh, symbols of, of social progress that needs to be reversed to make America great again. Yeah. Now, you say it happens almost immediately. I I explain that dynamic, because one would think that, especially in a situation such as the former Soviet, Soviet Union, there, there, there would be so much entrenched power, resistance, whatever there, that it would take a long time definitively. Why immediately? No, there's a, there are a lot of things that take a long time to change. No. Uh, and those generally tend to be formal institutions. But what maintains societies and what maintains states, in fact, are informal institutions. They're norms. Uh, they are cultural habits. And those are much more fragile than we realize. Yeah, for and, example? Um, well, let's take Trump's relationship with the media. I think, uh, you know, I, I've been paying very close attention to it because I think it's one of the most important things there are, but mm -hmm. it, I also sort of predicted uh, that that would be the first thing to suffer because it's the most obvious target and it's a way that he can uh, govern uh, or rule, uh, which I think is a more appropriate word for what he's going to try to do, uh, differently than his predecessors. And sure enough, we immediately see an adversary relationship with the media. We see him shutting out some of the press that he perceives as, uh, as critical. You know, yeah. The Washington Post was banned from his campaign. Uh, it's not clear who will have access to the White House. But just as important, is the fact that he doesn't talk to the media. He talks yeah. to the public directly through Twitter. Now, you may ask, well, why, you know, what's wrong with that? What's wrong yeah. with talking to the public directly? Uh, it's actually very destructive to public space as we understand it, right? We have used the media. Uh, as a society, we've used it as interpreters. Yeah. We've also used it as a place of discussion. So if you have a president who steps out of that space of discussion and says that's no longer relevant, that's a huge loss for the public sphere. And that happens really fast. I, I don't know if you were following the, the breaking news today, but yes. it had to do with the uh, Republicans' inclination to change the office of the uh, of the public uh, whatever the the the, uh, the ethics, ethics committee the yeah. ethics committee on uh, the OCE the, the office uh, officer of the it does, anyway it's an aspect of the yeah. ethics system on yeah. Capitol Hill, and it, it appeared their first act of this new Congress would be to, <laughs> to change it, <laughs> to repeal it to some degree. And Trump sent out a tweet mm -hmm. to the public, but obviously it seems aimed at his congressional following or, or those who may oppose him, basically saying, this is stupid, this is not the way to begin. Mm -hmm. And they almost immediately changed course, and now Trump is being given credit on CNN and MSNBC and obviously Fox as having accomplished something good with his tweets, whereas the criticism had been just the obvious. Right. They're just uh, the opposite. You know, I mean, that's, it's, it's a really interesting story that has just unfolded in the yeah. last couple of hours. But uh, first of all, it's a story about how the whole system of signaling 
on Capitol Hill has broken down. Yeah. Uh, these the, the the Republican leadership did not uh, support this move. Mm -hmm. These are rank and file Republicans who came up with this idea of suddenly abolishing the ethics office. Uh, it should be said it's a fairly new office. It's only eight years old, but um, but it clearly hadn't been sort of thought up in mm -hmm. the uh, in the leadership of the Republican Party. But I think that they came up with this idea because they figured that this would be Trumpian, yeah. right? And uh, and we see this a lot with populists. Instead of direct orders, you have these signals, and then everybody tries to be more you know Trump than Trump himself. Yeah. And then, you know, Trump has no dog in that fight. He can walk it back with a tweet and actually look moderate for, for a second. Yeah. And we forget that he had no investment in this particular uh, measure in the first place. So it didn't cost him anything. It wasn't, you know, the, what did he accomplish? He, he, he slapped yeah. down uh, some really insane measure. Mm -hmm. And he didn't even slap it down on, uh, you, you know, on substantive grounds. Yeah. He didn't say we need to keep the ethics office. He, he just said that's unimportant. Yeah. You, something else you wrote was entitled more or less staring into the face of autocracy. Do you see the, the makings of the, the elements of an autocrat in Donald Trump? Oh absolutely. I mean he ran for autocrat. He, Hillary Clinton was running for president and he was running for autocrat. And I think that's one of the big stories that the American media missed, was that we weren't watching, you know, a presidential election. We were watching a battle for, you know, world views, yeah. and a battle of views of system of governing. And and he, you know, because he ran for autocrat, I think we have to assume that he was elected autocrat. Now, unfortunately, previous administrations have laid the, laid the groundwork for that including the Obama administration. You know, Obama has governed by executive order more than any president in living memory. Uh, he has laid that groundwork for Trump. There has been an unprecedented concentration of power in the executive branch over the last 15 years, beginning with 9-11, with you know, the, uh, Bush sort of uh, assembling what amounts to extraordinary military powers, and then Obama continuing that legacy for a different set of reasons, but ultimately continuing to concentrate power in the executive branch. But when you've got an election where the, the central theme and the struggle to comprehend what happened afterwards was this disenchantment of a segment, a large segment of the American population that, that had lost faith in politicians and their ability to represent their interests, is an autocrat what they were looking for? That's... Um that seems to be what they're, they're looking Definitely. for. Uh, you know, he ran yeah. against the establishment. Uh, yeah. The American political establishment is marked by de deliberation, by slowness, by a distribution of power. Mm -hmm. He ran against all that quite explicitly. You know, it wasn't sort of some sort of a subliminal message in his anti-establishment theme. It was central to his anti-establishment theme. You know, his praise for Vladimir Putin came from that place. He praised him for having control of the country, unlike Obama. Yeah. Right? His idea of leadership is concentrating power. So if his approach is definitively autocratic, for those who rationalize the fact that he's now in the White House and say, well, whatever he said during the election campaign, it was campaign rhetoric, and he will inevitably soften it, change it, uh, massage it to suit the new circumstances. Do you see it that way? I don't see any reason other than wishful thinking to assume that. Yeah. I mean, why? Right? It's a very difficult thing to argue against because it's, it's actually a matter of faith and what be, people mm -hmm. are essentially saying when they're saying he's going to, uh, to, 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 to calm down and he's not going to be the, the character that his campaign rhetoric uh, conjured, they have absolutely no basis for saying that. Yeah. It is not characteristic of Trump to be calmer. Um, and to not be the character that he has spent not just the entire 18 months of the campaign creating, but his entire life creating, right? It's also not characteristic of past presidents. I mean, there's no historical precedent for, for, for this either. Uh, American presidents, by and large, are very consistent with their, uh, you know, the, their um, 
govern government is generally consistent with their campaigns. So this um, this this fallacy that campaigns are just campaigns and governing is is a different beast has no basis in fact. Uh, there was a terrific article by Evan Osnes in the New Yorker, I think, yeah. in September, where he laid it out. He actually looked at a number of studies and um, that showed that uh, between 70 and 80 percent of campaign promises are, in fact, carried out. So we need to be very serious about this, not just because autocrats, as a, as a rule, uh, tell you exactly what they're going to do, but because politicians, as a rule, tell you exactly what they're going to do. And a lot of the time, things that are born of sort of campaign passion uh, will become policy because they take on a life of their own. It may fall into the same category as wanting to rationalize the rhetoric, but you say that in an autocratic situation there is an impulse to normalize. Can you explain that? I think that um, you know we imagine autocracy with good reason as a catastrophe, an end of yeah. the world as we know it. But in fact, you know, the world has never ended. Uh, and, and so there's a, there's a kind of cognitive dissonance that happens when you wake up the morning after and the sun has indeed come up and you still have two, you know, two arms and two legs. Uh, and you can live in this situation. And so maintaining the idea that this is unlivable, this is not normal, when in fact it begins to feel normal very quickly. I mean, people adapt. That's, that's what we probably evolved to do as a species. Um, so you kind of have to maintain a tension that feels uncomfortable, uh, feels even unnatural, to continue to be able to recognize that this is not normal. Yeah. When you, you, you raise the similarities between Putin and, and Trump, is use of language, is the use of the facts and the truth or the lack thereof part of that? Yes, absolutely. And I think it might be one of the most important similarities. Yeah. Um, which is that they both, they both lie, and that's been well documented, but I think what's less understood is that they don't lie in order to avoid telling the truth. Uh, they lie in order to assert their power over reality. Uh, it's, it's a bully tactic. Uh, it's the sort of, I'm gonna say whatever I, I please. I assert my right to say whatever I please, and what are you going to do about it? And the answer is, we have no idea what to do about it. Is that part, so that is part of the power. It is, I can do this because I want to do this. It is, it is part of the power, it is part of the message. And it's not, I can do this because I want to do this. It's, I can say it because I want to say it. Too bad for the facts. So ha having, having seen the way this election campaign played itself out, has the impact on the media been to discourage fact-checking or to encourage it or somewhere else? Well, I mean, first of all, the impact on the media has been just absolutely devastating because yeah. I think there are a lot of people in the media, especially in sort of more established institutions, who feel that everything they do has become meaningless. Um, I don't think that's true, but I think there's, you know, it, there's um, uh, the, the, the media scholar Jay Rosen has written compellingly about the a crisis of trust, yeah. but I think there's also a crisis of confidence inside uh, you know, newspapers and, and, and magazines and television stations, but especially big newspapers like the New York Times. Um, and um, I think that a part of it is that they feel like they were doing the right thing by fact-checking Trump, yeah. uh, or you know, the Times uh, put incredible effort into finding his tax returns and put their the uh, personal security, the editor-in-chief put, uh, the, the, or the, 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 um, the I, think, what, I think the title is there. Managing executive editor. editor. Right? No, it's not the managing no. editor. Dean Beckett is, I think, executive, executive. editor. Yeah, yeah. Um, he put his personal security on the line. He, uh, he might mm -hmm. risk going to jail for publishing the tax return uh, because they thought it was essential and it would make a difference. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to have made a difference. Uh, but I think that there's a basic misunderstanding of how much you can accomplish with naked facts without telling the bigger story. Mm. And the analogy that I've been using, and I've actually been borrowing it from, uh, from my friend Gary Kasparov, uh, mm. the former ch mm -hmm. chess champion, who, uh, who would say this when he was talking about Putin, when he first quit chess and went up against Putin um, as a politician, he would say that dealing with Putin was like playing chess with somebody who kept knocking the, the, the figures off the board. <laughs> and I think that 
The big mistake uh, that uh, a lot of the established institutions made in covering the campaign was covering the campaign as though they were playing chess yeah. when Trump wasn't playing chess. Yeah. And so, you know, they would say, well, you know, she, Hillary started, uh, you know, uh, H2 to H4, and um, Trump knocked the figures off the chessboard, <laughs> and he knocked the knight off the chessboard, and he knocked the bishop off the chessboard, instead of saying he wasn't playing chess. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter which figures he knocked off the chessboard. So is right. that part of the distinction you draw between fact-checking fact and telling the truth? Yes. I think that we need to stop focusing quite so much on the facts. We still need to focus on the facts. But we need mm -hmm. to tell the bigger story of what is happening to us, right? And that's the difference between facts and truth. Uh, just an agglomeration of facts is not yet the truth. You have to have the courage and the confidence to tell the story. Yeah. Much has been made about relationships, real or imaginary, between Donald Trump and, and Vladimir Putin. The relationships that the people around Trump may have, Paul Manafort, Rex Tillerson, Carter Page, uh, who, who am I missing? Uh, Michael Flynn. Right. Uh, do you see that as being important or inconsequential? I don't think we know enough to know how important it is. I think what we do know, uh, the biggest sort of chunk of knowledge that we have is about Rex Tillerson. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think it's it's worrisome. You know, it's worrisome that he's a friend of Putin. Uh, uh, and uh, it's worrisome that, uh, that he's a deal maker who's made successful deals with Russia. And that has, I think, it required extreme flexibility, yeah. extreme even for an American CEO, oil CEO, which already suggests extreme flexibility. Yeah. But I actually find other things about Rex Tillerson much more worrisome. Right? I find it worrisome that uh, he ran uh, what some climate analysts have called the worst oil company in the yeah. world. Uh, that Exxon had a long-standing uh, policy of climate denial, mm -hmm. and that they were de they were being climate denialists even when they internally acknowledged the science behind climate change. Now, I find that worrisome not just because it's a terrible thing to do and it's been terrible for the environment, but because of what that tells us about Tillerson's ability to imagine the future and to plan for the future. So, what I'm worried about is more sort of the similarities between the Russian government and the incoming American government, which is that they're not at all future-oriented. In fact, they have no concept for the future. It's the, you know, uh, the, um, après nous le déluge kind of uh, attitude of, any, you know, we, we'll, we'll amass riches, we'll govern uh, for as long as we can, and then come what may. So that is much more worrisome than any financial or human connections. And as a matter of fact, uh, one other thing that I want to point out about Trump is that Trump is not known for being a loyal friend or a good ally. In fact, he's yeah. known for screwing over his contractors, for, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, not to mention his wives. His wives. He's, not, he's known for defaulting on his debts. I don't think there's a lot to be gained from analyzing you know, his, his debt structure and how much he owes, because that's actually not what's going to rule his behavior. Mm -hmm. But I think that his character traits and his uh, sincere admiration for Putin, which is a matter of public record. You don't have to dig for it to understand sort of what, what we're dealing with. Admiration, which he's expressed, r rightly or wrongly, to whatever degree. But any real relationship between the two, to your knowledge? I don't think it matters. Uh, we don't have enough information about it. We don't mm. have, and I don't think, you know, I don't think that the speculation is going to give us anything because mm. You know, let's just reason this through, right? Um, suppose we find out that there is a relationship between Trump and Putin, that, you know, as some people have suggested, Putin has compromising information on Trump, or as other people have suggested, um, Trump has, you know, huge financial liabilities that link him to Russia. So what? Right? Again, we, he's not known for being good, uh, uh, for making good on his debts, uh, and he's not known for fearing being, you know, ha having his reputation damaged. So that will not give us any additional information. Everything that we need to know in terms of Trump's uh, danger to the world is out in the open. It's in his tweets. It's in his campaign statements. 
It's in his uh, statements during the debates, and it's plenty worrisome on its own. You don't need a conspiracy theory to worry more. Yeah. Let, let's look at it from the opposite point of view. What does Vladimir Putin have to gain by a close relationship with Donald Trump? So I think Putin uh, imagines that he is now the most powerful man in the world. Yeah. Uh, and this is not conjecture on my part. He has said as much. He had, a, he had his annual press conference and now, you know, we're in the world of presidents who have one press conference a year. So he um, had his annual press conference at the end of December, and it's a scripted affair. So he had a journalist ask him, what does it feel like to be the most uh, powerful man in the world? Mm. And Putin sort of snickered and went into this sort of um, soliloquy on being the most powerful man in the world. Um, stemming from the idea that somehow Russia engineered mm -hmm. the election of Donald Trump. Uh, I think that he thinks that he's going to be able to manipulate and manage Trump. But there are two problems with this, and Putin being a man who doesn't look into the future, has no planning horizon, mm -hmm. has not yet considered these. Uh, but we should consider them because this, uh, this is risky. One is that there can only be one most powerful man in the world, and it's actually generally been part of the American president's job yeah. description. So I think that there's going to be a clash over their self-perception. The other thing is that Putin really needs America as an enemy. Uh, that's the imaginary uh, threat yeah. that has allowed him to shore up his popularity by uh, by mobilizing the population against you know this 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 imaginary threat from the United States, the wars that he has fought in Ukraine and Syria have, for domestic purposes, been proxy wars with yeah. the United States. So he might actually, uh, after a short spike, because he's perceived as the most powerful man in the world, he might actually see a loss to his popularity because the mobilization will not be quite as effective. So he will either need to conjure an enemy inside the country, and then we will see a much greater political crackdown in Russia, which is already a pretty bad place mm -hmm. to be uh, differently minded, or we'll see him resurrecting the specter of the American threat. Yeah, so when, when Trump says the things he does about Putin, is that because that's the anti-Obama foreign policy and he wants to be seen as being the anti-Obama? Um, I think he definitely wants to be seen as the anti-Obama. I think that he is, again, uh, you know, we have no reason not to take Trump at his word. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that when he expresses admiration for Putin, it is because he feels mm -hmm. admiration for Putin. Uh, he thinks that that's what leadership should be like. He thinks that, you know, the popularity rankings in the, in the 80, 80th percentile are what leadership is about. He thinks that controlling every branch of government is what real power looks like. And that's what he's telling us. So when we hear that the U.S. intelligence community has a consensus that state-sponsored computer hacking attempted to interfere to some degree in some way with the presidential election, does that also fall into the what does it matter category? Uh, well, yes, it does actually, because, <laughs> because um, I mean, what, what the intelligence community is telling us, first of all, it isn't much. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but but what, what they, uh, they're telling us is that they have concluded with a high degree of confidence, uh, which is as, as certain as they ever get, that the hacks of the Democratic National Committee were carried out by, uh, by Russian um, agents mm -hmm. working in concert with the state or working for the state, two different uh, Russian agents. Right? That's actually, uh, that statement is a far cry from saying that Russians hacked the election, yeah. which is how it's been uh, spun a lot of the time. Because there are several logical steps there, right? One is, uh, we can probably assume, but we don't know this, that the Russian, hacks, uh, the Russian hackers gave the information, or the Russian state agencies gave the information to Julian Assange, yeah. who then leaked, uh, released it through WikiLeaks. We have absolutely no information to confirm that the timing of the release was arranged by the Russians and not by Assange himself. Yeah. Uh, it, much more important is that we have no way to show that it was in any way um, influential in the outcome of the American election, yeah. right? 
So the, you know, the, the, the distance you have to travel from the Russian hacks of the DNC to the idea that Russians actually influenced the election and that they did it intentionally. And then their intention was not just to be disruptive but to elect Donald Trump. That's a very, very lo long distance. Yeah. And would you see it as a device to try to question the legitimacy of, of Donald Trump's victory as opposed to anything else? I think that questioning the legitimacy of an American vote is a really slippery slope that I don't want to go down. I, th I thought that of the appeals to the Electoral College to vote against Trump. I think that was also a very slippery slope. I mean, basically, it's the kind of strategy that works if you're never going to have another presidential election yeah. again. Um, because, again, let's, you know, let's reason through this. Suppose we make the argument that because the Russians tried to influence the election, right? That's the most powerful statement we can make. That because the Russians tried to influence the election, we have to invalidate the election. That gives Russians the power to invalidate every election, uh, American election ever going forward because all they have to do is demonstrate that they're trying to influence it. Okay? Um, so that means America will never be able to have another election again. Yeah. Um, not to mention the incredible damage that would be done to the faith in the electoral system by delegitimizing a vote that by all accounts was you know, properly carried out and properly uh, counted. I think there are much more interesting and much more important issues you know, that have to do with interference with the, with the election by, you know, by local Republicans or by vo local voting uh, of, uh, officials all over the country. That's what we should be looking at. That's a real danger to the legitimacy of the American electoral system. It's American. It's not Russian. Yeah. Given your personal experience, both in Russia and now the United States, do you believe you look at the outcome of this surprising, to put it mildly, election in a different way from Americans? Yes. How? Uh, I, um, well, first of all, I was convinced it was going to happen. But, you know, really? I don't, yes. And I, what convinced you? Um, oh, well, th that's the thing, is that um, I think that I have my own bias. I just think that when you have a populist demagogue who shows up on the scene, mm -hmm. um, a democracy, generally speaking, cannot stand up to populist demagogue. At the same time, you know, now we know that the election was decided by something like 75,000 voters in yeah. three counties. Uh, so you might even argue that I was wrong because Hillary Clinton won the popular vote for yeah. nearly, by nearly three million votes. Um, so I was wrong to predict that Trump was going to be an irresistible force uh, in terms of winning popularity. I accidentally happened to be right in predicting that he was going to win the election. Uh, but I think that that, you know, that, that pessimism that, um, that the Russian experience has given me uh, yeah. has, makes, you know, makes my view of things a little different. I also think I recognize certain things perhaps a little faster than most American observers just because I know what to look for, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the classic argument about whether this is a tactic or a distraction is so familiar to me because in Russia we were having this argument you know, yeah. for the last 17 years. Uh, so, for example, when the argument first broke out around the, the Hamilton uh, the, sure. uh, incident, yeah. uh, when Mike Flynn, the vice president-elect, went to see Hamilton, Mike Pence. was uh, oh, I'm sorry, Definitely. Mike Pence, the vice president-elect, went to see. Uh, yeah, he has a lot of mics in his administration. Yes, that's true. <laughs> so when Mike Pence, the vice president, like went to see Hamilton on Broadway and was booed, yeah. and uh, and Pence actually interestingly had a sort of boilerplate uh, American political response, which is he said, "This is what the what freedom of speech sounds like." Yeah. But Trump tweeted that it was outrageous, that they should apologize, yeah. uh, that it should be a safe space. It wasn't just that he was booed; it was also that the cast addressed. Mike Pence in a very respectful manner, mm. but, uh, but addressed him uh, sort of with a speech to the responsibility he has now as the vice president, like to all Americans who are scared of the incoming administration. Now the argument was, is what Trump tweeting a distractionary uh, 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 tactic because he wants us to be thinking about Hamilton instead of thinking about real things? Yeah. Uh, and I happen to think that 
first of all, nothing is a distraction, that arguing about what's a distraction is the ultimate distraction, because everything matters. Yeah. Uh, but specifically, his attack on, public, on the public sphere and on, um, on sort of the norms of the public sphere are really important. They're not a distraction. They might feel little uh, it, compared to you know, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act uh, or his immigration policies. But they're not little at all, because no democracy can survive without a public sphere. Yeah, speaking of his tweets, I can't remember whether I read it or heard it or saw you say it, but at some point you spoke about what you understand to be the origin of much of the material in his tweets. It wasn't actually uh, me. It was, uh, I, I referred to an, uh, an article that BuzzFeed did, and they did uh, a terrific, uh, I mean, this is the sort of thing mm -hmm. that I think journalists should be doing more of. You know, look at the bigger picture. Look not just at the tweets, but look at what the tweets tell us about the bigger picture. What they did is they analyzed his news sources. Uh, what Trump's tweets tell us about what, he's, what media he is consuming. Yeah. And they discovered that he gets the bulk of his information from Breitbart. Uh, and Which tells you what? Uh, it tells us that, in essence, uh, he ha is already in the position of a dictator, of an isolated dictator, because he is already watching Trump TV. And he has been watching Trump TV for at least a year or so, uh, or 18 months. That's the, yeah. that's the amount of time that they analyzed. Uh, so he's already in the Putin position of watching Putin TV. You know, Putin's reality bubble is created by uh, television that aims to please him and translate his messages to the world, but then Putin also has himself mirrored back to him by Russian television, and he gets, the, and he acts in accordance to what he sees on Russian television. It's, it's, it's a closed circuit. And Trump is already in this closed circuit. He gets his information from his own mouthpiece. Yeah. Putin, I think it's fair to say, has literally taken over the media in, in Russia. Is it just figurative with Donald Trump, or do you see something darker in the future there? So this is, this is an important distinction. Uh, I don't think that Trump is going to be able to take over the media in the way that Putin was able to take over the media. I mean, Putin, within a year of coming into office, had actual hands-on control of all the broadcast television in Russia. And everything else after that was almost a matter of sort of inertia uh, and habit, uh, because really having control over broadcast television is plenty enough to, um, <laughs> to control the, uh, the, the, the population mm -hmm. and the views of the population and the, and the information that the population gets. Um, Trump is not going to be able to do that literally. Yeah. There's no way for the American president, yeah. you know, short of declaring a state of emergency and uh, God knows what other kinds of extraordinary powers, uh, to do that. What he can try to do and what he's already uh, doing is trying to render the media completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think his using tweets is such an important issue in and of itself. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be paying attention to the tweets, mm -hmm. but it means that we need to really redouble our efforts to make the media essential to the public conversation. And that probably means, among other things, changing the voice of the media, you know, sort of the, the disembodied objective voice of the New York Times uh, has been archaic for a long time, uh, but it's like, it's catastrophically archaic now. You've effectively said you've seen this movie before, or a, a, a variety of it. Um, looking forward to what's ahead in this administration of the 45th president of the United States, what are you going to look for? What are the signs, the signals that you'll be alert to? Well, see, this is, this is where it gets really tricky. Because even when you put, put a question like that, it's a way of normalizing uh, the Trump presidency. Because what I'm really scared of is nuclear war, which I think is a real possibility. Uh, you don't look for signs of nuclear war. <laughs> you just, you know, it just, uh, so I'm, I'm really worried about uh, a quick end to the honeymoon with Russia mm -hmm. and a conflict that spirals out of control you know, at breakneck speed. 
What I'm really worried about is the near certainty of uh, irreversible damage to the climate that will make you know, our survival as a species impossible. And Trump is capable of carrying that out and has every intention of carrying that out. So everything else becomes a little secondary, and yet it's the everything else that we actually are going to end up talking about because this other stuff is so far outside of our control. Uh, so you know, with that caveat, that this is already normalizing. Uh, I'm certainly going to be looking at um, at what happens to the public sphere. That's that's my my biggest area of concern for yeah. for myself. For you know, the, as long as we can live in this world and in this country, um, what happens to that? I'm going to be looking for what happens, to, uh, what choices people make, mm -hmm. what our conversation about principles and morality uh, is. Um, I'm going to be looking for uh, ba uh, basic conversations about values because I think that there are some interesting things that we haven't even talked about uh, because there hasn't been room to talk about yeah. them. You know, but Donald Trump is the first um, American president who's not religious. Uh, not he, to hear him tell it, but <laughs> to hear those around him tell it. Uh, right, but I mean, he, uh, he... He had his mother's Bible. He had his mother's right. Bible. Uh, but he has, you know, he has not run as a religious president, and um, he he's on his third wife. He has a his family. Uh, what's uh, this is really interesting to me. You know, his family looks much more like a, a regular American family yeah. than the family of any other president yeah. we have had in living memory. Uh, he has a blended family, a multi generational family. Uh, he has, you know, a family business. Those could be great things, and they're going to be awful things because of the way he uses them, because he's going to use that family structure to actually create uh, some sort of a mafia state. He's already starting to do that. What I'm really worried about is that the, re the knee-jerk reaction uh, of those who, who oppose Trump will tend in a very conservative direction, because how do you react to a family like that's, that, that that's doing horrible things? How, how can you be nuanced about it? And acknowledge the fact that this alternative vision uh, of the traditional family that this family, uh, the, yeah. the first family, offers is actually a really good thing. It's one of the few good things that can possibly come out of a Trump presidency. Um, I'm similarly interested in in the conversation about corruption and sort of the the, the deep values yeah. that that reaches into, because I think that there are some uh, there's some really important stuff in there, and I'm worried about a knee-jerk uh, social conservatism that's going to rear its head, because that's the only thing we, have, we sort of can, can rest on in the opposition. So, you know, there's a rich, uh, so there's a rich tapestry of, of things to think about um, and to fear, uh, but, but again, you know, talking about those things and thinking about those things, while that may be intellectually uh, stimulating, is also a way of normalizing.